find yourself lost in the middle of a raging river without any hope for survival? Shoulda bought a coulda shoulda woulda canoe. An obnoxiously bright orange and squeaky life-saving device. Only 95.75 today. Call 1313 Canoe. That's 1313 Canoe to get your coulda shoulda woulda canoe today. Coulda shoulda woulda. Any incidents involving a coulda shoulda woulda canoe are not a responsibility of the coulda shoulda woulda corporation. Activities heard in this commercial may result in death, starvation, severe sunburns, and maybe a good story for your grandkids. Welcome back to Fia Explains, where we read and analyze literature and crack a few jokes in between. Today, we'll be going over Gabriel Garcia Marquez's Light is Like Water. But first, let's take a dive into his background, his past, and what led him to be the author he is today. Born on March 26, 1977, in Aracataca, Colombia, Gabriel García Márquez, sometimes known as Gabito to loved ones, was always a writer. Raised until the age of eight by his grandparents, who he credits for his exposure to the wonders of literature, he grew up to become a successful journalist in the 1950s and 60s until retiring his journalism hat and focusing on creative writing. A year after the publication of his third book, The Autumn of the Patriarch, Marquez released this short story. Light is like water. On Christmas, the children asked for a rowboat again. Okay, said the dad, we'll buy it when we get back to Cartagena. Toto, nine years old, and Joel, seven, were more determined than their parents believed. No, No, they said as one. We need it here and now. To begin with, said the mom, here there aren't any more navigable waters than those that come from the shower. Both she and her husband were right. At the house in Cartagena there was a deck with a dock on the bay and a boathouse for two large yachts. On the other hand, here in Madrid, they lived cramped together on the fifth floor of 47 Castellano Road. But in the end, neither he nor she could deny them, because they had promised them a rowboat with sextant and compass if they got perfect grades for the school term. And they had been gotten. And so it was that the dad bought it all without saying anything to his wife, who was the most resistant to making debts for pleasure. It was a beautiful boat of aluminum, with a golden line painted around the draft line. The boat is in the garage, the dad revealed during lunch. The problem is that there's no way to get it up the stairs, and there's no more space available in the garage. However, the following Saturday afternoon, the children invited their classmates to help them bring the boat up, and they managed to get it as far as the service room. Congratulations, the dad told them. And now what? Now nothing, said the children. We just wanted to have a rowboat in the room, and now there is. On Wednesday night, as on every Wednesday, the parents went to the movies. The children, masters and lords of the house, closed the door and windows, and broke the light bulb burning in one of the lamps in the living room. A jet of golden light as cool as water began to flow from the broken bulb, and they let it run until it reached the depth of four handspans. Then they turned off the current, got the boat out, and sailed at their pleasure around the islands of the house. This fabulous adventure was the result of an offhand comment of mine when I was participating in a seminar on the poetry of domestic appliances. Toto asked me, how come the light turned on just by pressing a button, and I wasn't brave enough to think twice about it. Light is like water, I answered him. You open the tap and it comes out. So they kept sailing Wednesday nights, learning to master the sextant and compass until the parents came home to find them asleep like angels on dry land. Months later, eager to go even further, they asked for a submarine fishing equipment with everything, masks, fins, tanks, and compressed air shotguns. It's bad enough they have a rowboat in the service room that they can't use, said the dad, but it's even worse they want scuba diving equipment on top of it. And if we get gold stars for the first semester, asked Joel, No, their mom said, frightened. No more. The dad reproached her inflexibility. It's just that these kids don't get anything for doing what they're supposed to, she said, but for a whim, they could earn a teaching position. In the end, the parents didn't say either yes or no, but Toto and Joel won the gold stars in July and were publicly recognized by the principal. That same afternoon, without their having asked again, they found the scuba equipment in their room in the original packing. 
So the following Wednesday, while the parents were watching The Last Tango in Paris, they filled the apartment to the depth of two arm lengths, and they scooped around like tame sharks under the furniture and the beds, and they rescued from the depths of the light the things that had been lost in the darkness. It's won three Academy Award nominations, Best Screenplay, Best Foreign Film, and Best Director, winner of the Grand Prize at Venice Film Festival, a quote, political thriller of unmatched realism, New York Times, so striking and emotional it was banned in France until 1971, in theaters once again, Guillaume Pontecorvo's The Battle of Algiers. At the award ceremony at the end of the year, the brothers were acclaimed as examples for the school and they were given certificates of excellence. This time, they didn't have to ask for anything because the parents asked them what they wanted. They were so reasonable that they only wanted a party at home to reward their friends from school. The dad, alone with his wife, was radiant. It's proof of their maturity, he said. From your lips to God's ears, said the mom. The following Wednesday, while the parents were watching the Battle of Ariel, the people who were walking along Castellana Road saw a cascade of light falling from an old building hidden among the trees. It was coming out of the balconies, it fell in torrents from the façade, and it channeled down the Great Avenue in a golden rapid that illuminated the city to the Guadarrama River. Responding to the alarm call, the fire- firemen forced open the door to the fifth floor apartment and found the whole place filled with light, up to the ceiling. The sofa and the leopard skin armchairs were floating at different levels in the living room, between the bottles from the bar and the grand piano and its manila shawl which fluttered along mid-water like a golden monterey. The domestic appliances, at the zenith of their poetry, were flying with their own wings around the skies of the kitchen. The instruments from the marching band that the children used to dance floated among the colored tropical fish liberated from the mom's fishbowl, and which were the only living and happy floating things in the vast illuminated swamp. In the bathroom, the toothbrushes floated along with Dad's condoms, Mom's jar of old cold cream and her retainer, and the television in the master bedroom floated sideways, still on, showing the last scenes of the late-night adult movie. At the end of the hall, floating between two waters, Toto was seated at the stern of the rowboat, glued to the oars, with his scuba mask on, searching for the lighthouse of the port until his tanks ran out of air. Joel floated in the prow, still trying to measure the height of the North Star with his sextant, and floating throughout the house were his 36 classmates, eternally preserved in the instant of peeing in the pot of geraniums, of seeing the school song which the verses changed to mock the principal, of sneaking a glass of Dad's brandy. They had opened so many lights at the same time that the house had overflowed, and the whole fourth grade class of St. Julian, the hospitalier, had drowned in the fifth-floor apartment of 47 Castellana Road, Madrid, Spain, a remote city of burning summers and frozen winds, without sea or river, and whose original landlubber inhabitants had never mastered the science of sailing on light. December 1978. So now that we're done with the stuffy part of the podcast, let's get into analysis. Um, first of all, this story's from the perspective of like a third-person narrator. So this person has personally met the children but also is telling the story from an outside perspective was not there when it happened um and i like that when he brings up you know uh that he told the kid or because the answer to the kid's question um was that light behaves like water it's almost like he spoke that into existence and just because the kid believed in it uh you know it became true which i think is really interesting because I think a really big part of magical realism is imagination and this idea that, you know, if you believe in something hard enough, it it's true, it's real. Um, even if not, not everyone else sees it. Uh, and yeah, I just, I really liked that part. Um, also, Marquez just uses like insane visual descriptions. Like when I was reading this story and I hope that I was able to uh you know project that when I was rereading it out loud but he just has great visuals like everything that he was saying was full of life and personification uh, is something he uses a lot and just yeah like every word I read I could see it in my head which was really interesting um I especially liked the part where he was like talking about at the very end of the story when he's talking about the kids um uh ha- at the having the party and uh that 
quote, a cascade of light falling from an old building hidden among the trees. It fell with torrents from the facade and, uh, and it channeled down the great avenue into the golden rapid that illuminated the city. Like that part, I was just like, whoa. Because, I don't know, just like, that's a really cool thing to imagine. Because it would never happen in real life, because light doesn't behave like that. It was just really enjoyable. Um, and uh, I like that, you know, part of magical realism is that usually the science in the universe is somewhat based in something magical. Uh, so I liked that, you know, the point that the tropical fish that the mom had, like, were surviving in this light as if it was water. Like, there was a lot of detail, I thought, put into the story that made the world believable. Um, yeah.